السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Welcome to the third session of praying tarawih at home Today we're going to talk about how the sahaba رضي الله عنهم used to pray and was there any uh, tarawih in the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم So as we start I'd like to introduce Imam Abdul Nasir to start us off بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I pray and hope to Allah سبحانه وتعالى that the third session we find you in a best state of iman and health and we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to protect us from this virus, from this pandemic, our families, our loved ones, the Muslim community and the human community at large. Today's session is about how did the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum pray qiyamul lil or tahajjud or recite the Quran. We have a few ahadith that explain to us how this was done. The first hadith is from Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ma or anhum. They are all three sahaba. Salim, he is the son of Abdullah who is the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with them. And Abdullah ibn Umar, he had he, this was when he was young and he had a dream and he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to, you know, explain the dream. The part about the dream is not really uh, connected to what we want to talk about, but the last part of the hadith, Abdullah, he said, Anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam qala ni'ma rajul Abdullah law kana yusalli min al-layl. نِعْمَ الرَّجُلْ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ لَوْ كَانَ يُصَلِّي مِنَ اللَّيْمِ فقال سالم his son فكان عبد الله بعد ذلك لا ينام من الليل إلا قليلا حديث متفق عليه So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم or the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said What a wonderful man عبد الله If only he prayed at night. So the Prophet ﷺ first praised him. What a wonderful person. What a wonderful man. But then he said something in a very nice way, in a very gentle way. لو كان يصلي من الليل. If only he would pray at night. And so his son, Salim, he said, after this, after he heard this from the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he hardly slept at night. He hardly slept at night. He spent most of his night in prayer because of what the Prophet ﷺ said about him. The second hadith is by Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And I'm just going to do the English part because this is a long hadith. He was reciting Surah Al-Baqarah at night and his horse was tied beside him. The horse suddenly was startled and troubled. So he stopped reciting. And when the recit recitation stopped, the horse come down. So he started reading again and reciting. And again, the horse was startled and he was troubled and he was behaving like he was afraid or something like that. 
And this happened a few times. Yahya, the son of Husayd ibn Hudayr, was lying next to his father. And so Husayd, he was afraid that the horse might trample him. And so he stopped and he took his son from this dangerous situation and he went out. He looked up to the sky and he saw like a cloud with lamps in it. So in the morning, he went to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him what happened at night. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, do you know what that was? That was the angels coming closer to listen to your recitation. That was the angels coming close to listen to your recitation. So the angels, they come and they listen to our prayers and our recitation of the Holy Quran. This is hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Also, we have another hadith that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha <clears throat> used to pray after the departure of the, our beloved Prophet وسلم, and she was led in prayer by a slave, her slave, and he did not memorize the Quran, so he was holding the Mus'haf. He read from, from the Quran, from the book, from the Mus'haf. So this shows us that it is permissible to read from the Mus'haf in the prayer, Salat al-Qiyam al-Layl or Tahajjud. Also, we have another proof and evidence from a great Imam, Imam Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Uh, he is no relation to me, but he is the Shaykh of Imam Malik. He is one of the Shaykh of Imam Malik, Rahmatullahi alayhim ajma'een. So Imam Ibn Shihab was asked about a man who reads from the Mus'haf in Ramadan, in the prayer. He said, the best ones amongst us used to read from the Mus'haf. The best ones amongst us, amongst the scholars, amongst the shuyukh, amongst the ulama, they used to read from the Mus'haf. So there is nothing wrong with that. Some people find a problem with reading from the Mus'haf, but these are clear proofs that this is not the case. It is not a problem at all. Our another hadith about the great Sahabi Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who said, awsani khalili bi thalathin my beloved, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he advised me about three things. La ada'hunna hatta amut. I will not leave them. I will not stop performing them until I die. What are these three things? Siyamu thalathati ayyamin kulli shahr. Fasting three days out of every month. As we know, it is Sunnah to fast Mondays and Thursdays, or to fast Al Ayyam Al Bid, 13, 14, and 15 of the lunar month, the lunar calendar. So, this is one of the wasaya, one of the advices of the Prophet to Abu Huraira. Fasting three days out of every month. Another one is Salat al duha Salat al duha What is Salat al duha Two rak'a, four or more. Up to you that you perform after the sun rises about 15 minutes or so. 
until before dhuhr you can pray them anytime this is salat al duha wa nawmun ala witr and go to sleep after you pray witr wa fi riwayatin ukhra an utira qabla an anam in another narration that i perform witr before i go to sleep so abu huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he used to divide the night into three parts divide the nights into three parts between himself his wife and his servant and they used to take turns first one of them would start praying and then when he's done with his chair he would wake up the next one his wife and then he would go to rest then his wife would take the second shift for example and then when she's done with her share she would wake up the servant and he would pray the last part or you know something like this so his whole family would pray all night long and this is something that we can do as a family we can follow the example of abu huraira a great sahabi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and divide the night amongst family members and share in the good deeds in the hasanat in the ajr also another hadith narrated by anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went inside the masjid al masjid an nabawi فإذا حبل ممدود بين الساريتين he found a rope that was extended between two pillars in the masjid somebody tied a rope between two pillars فقال ما هذا الحبل so he asked what is this rope قالوا هذا حبل لزينب إذا فترت تعلقت به. This is a rope for Zainab. When she prays at night and she gets tired, she can no longer stand up. She would hold on to it. فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم حلوه ليصلي أحدكم نشاطه فإذا فتر فليرقد حديث متفق عليه Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said untie this rope pray as long as you have the energy as long as you are able to if you get tired go to sleep like we said in the first session ما جعل عليكم في الدين من حرج Allah did not make any difficulty, any hardship for you in this religion. يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر. Allah intends ease for you, not difficulty, not hardship. This again tells us that we can pray at night in Ramadan or around throughout the year, small portion. We don't have to finish the whole Quran. We don't have to exert ourselves more than what our bodies are able to, you know, to do. So these are a few uh, illustrations of the Sahaba, how they used to pray, Qiyam al-Layl, how they used to do Tahajjud. Hopefully that was beneficial. Do we have another question, Brother Mahan? Yes, Jazakum Allah Khair. The next question is about the Taraweeh prayer at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Did the Sahaba Dilanum pray with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during Ramadan? 
جزاك الله خير منك الله خير the beginning of taraweeh the beginning of the way that we pray actually started with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so one night in Ramadan he came out and he usually prays in his room with Aisha we have many a hadith that show us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam usually he prays in his room one hadith which Aisha narrates that when the Prophet ﷺ was praying at night and when he was going into sujood, he would move her feet a little bit and he make his sujood and then, you know. So this hadith shows that he was praying in the room that he shares with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. But one night he came out in the masjid and he started praying. Some of the Sahaba, they saw him and they joined. Because always the masjid of the Prophet Wasallam, there were people in there. There were homeless people. Amongst them, of course, is the famous Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Ahlul Suffa, the people who took or used the masjid as their home. Because they don't, they were they were from somewhere else, and so they they don't didn't have anywhere to stay, so they stayed in the masjid. So some of the Sahaba they joined the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that first night. Then he came again, and here we have many different narrations. Some say that it was an odd night in Ramadan, and then he came on another odd night. Some a hadith jadir say he came the next night. Anyway, he came again. And this time, some of the other Sahaba that were not there the first night, they heard about his coming out. And so they came expecting him to come and they joined. And the crowd was larger than the first time. Then, again here, different narrations. Did he pray two nights or three nights? Allah knows best. But Let's say that he prayed three nights. So the third night, the masjid was full. It was crowded. People did not even have room to stand. But they came and they prayed with the Prophet ﷺ. And the prayer lasted almost until Fajr. More people heard about it. And the, let's say the fourth night, everybody was there. The masjid was completely full. But the Prophet ﷺ did not come out. They waited, they waited, they waited, but he did not come out all night long. He came out for Fajr. He led the prayer and then he turned to them and he said, I know that you were waiting for me. And the only thing that prevented me from coming out was I was afraid it would be made obligatory upon you and you will not be able to handle it. So the Prophet وسلم, out of his mercy and his compassion for his ummah, he decided not to come out that, that last night because he was afraid that this taraweeh would be made compulsory, obligatory upon his ummah, and it's too much for them to handle. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is how the taraweeh started. Now, later on, and we will talk about that tomorrow, inshallah, Umar al-Khattab, he decided to bring them together. Now, why? Could he do that? Because the Prophet وسلم, when he died, there is no more tashri'ah, there is no more legislation. The last few verses of the Quran that were revealed, 
اليوم اكملت لكم دينكم واتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيتم لكم الاسلام دينا this day i have completed and perfected your religion for you so with the death of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم tarawih could not be made obligatory anymore so during his time during his lifetime the wahi was still being revealed it could have been made obligatory that's why he didn't come out but after alhamdulillah now as we mentioned that uh, in the surah al muzammil the last verse the long verse inna rabbaka ya'lamu annaka taqumu adna min thulathay al-layl wa nisfahu wa thulathahu wa ta'ifatun min alladhina ma'ak wallahu yuqaddiru al-layl wa an-nahar we said that the sahaba during the lifetime of the prophet they used to pray qiyam al-layl so it is mentioned in the quran and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala merciful compassionate he said to us faqra'u ma tayassara min al-quran it was one third or two third or one half or but here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us his mercy and his compassion فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Read whatever is available, feasible, what you can, what you are able to do. Don't have to do half a night. You don't have to do a third of a night. You don't have to do two-thirds of a night. But do something. فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ Don't leave it empty. Even if you read قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Or a few surahs. But don't just completely abandon it. So inshallah, we will stop here. And if you have any questions or comments or corrections, inshallah, let us hear those. Jazakumullahu khair. Naam ya khair. Jazakumullahu khair. So uh, as the questions are going to come in, um, okay. what I'm going to do is go ahead and review some of the things that we talked about already in terms of proofs and stuff that are going to be relevant for Friday. So one of the things that we talked about is that Qiyam and Tahajjud, some of the scholars differentiated them, but in general, praying at night um, was what we were discussing, and it could be done anytime uh, after we pray Aisha until uh, Fajr time comes in. And um, on that note, if Imam the Nasir, if you could just mention a little bit about how to divide the night into three parts, when does it start and when does it end um, the night? The night could be divided into different ways. So in Islam, like really the, the, the night started starts at Maghrib, at Maghrib time, we have, you know, a new. But we here talking about like after Isha, okay? After Isha, this, the night goes from after Isha until dawn, until Fajr. And of course, depending on the season the night could be just a few hours or it could be 10 12 16 hours so really around the spring time is where it is equal between the night and the day 12 hours each but in the summertime it could be as little as you know, eight hours. And the more north you go, then the night becomes shorter and shorter and vice versa during the summer and during the, you know, the winter. So you could divide your night, for example, uh, let's say Aisha, you pray at 10 o'clock and Fajr come in at uh, like six o'clock. So you have, about, you have about eight hours. So you can divide it into two, two and a half hours each, and you have three, three parts of the night. So if you have like Abu Hurairah did, him and his wife and his slave servant, so you could spend two, two and a half hours each, and that means that you covered uh, most of the night. And Allah knows best, I don't know, that's answered your question. Yes, Allah can. So another, another thing that we were discussing was that we have a proof that the Prophet ﷺ prayed in jama'ah at home 
as well as praying jama'ah in the masjid. And uh, so this is going to be good proof for us that at home we can definitely pray in, uh, in jama'ah. Also, that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to pray two by two by two. So whatever is easy for a person, they can pray. And there's no set limit for that person. We also discussed this. Today we also discussed the proof that a person can read from the Mus'haf um, in the Hadith of Aisha Ghulanha. And we also talked about whatever is easy for a person at the end of Surah Al-Muzammin, whatever that might be in terms of recitation, in terms of, uh, in terms of the length of the Salah, whatever is easy for a person, that's what Allah Azza wa Jalla intended over here. And then the Prophet ﷺ did, in fact, pray in Ramadan until at one point, it was almost time for suhoor. So these are proofs that we're going to definitely go back to, inshallah, on Friday to give us guidelines so that we can make sure when we pray at home, we stick to those guidelines, inshallah. In the meantime, we have a question. Can we pray tarawih by reading the Quran and doing sujood 20 times each night? Again, one more time. This is not considered, are you? I'm on? So this is not considered to be, you know, a prayer. A prayer is, starts with takbirat al-ihram and ends with taslim. So what, I mean, that's a good thing to do, to read the Quran and to make, uh, you know, but you don't call it salat. And salat has a, a definition, specific de definition. It starts with the takbira, takbira al ihram, you face the qibla, and it ends with the taslim. That's what, we, that's what we call as a prayer. That's what we call salat. Reading the Quran is beneficial. It is, you know, has its merits, but it is something different from the, uh, from, you know, salat al tarawih Wallahu ta'ala alam. Okay, another question. Is there required, is it required for the followers to also recite Al-Fatiha behind the Imam? We have two different, we have two different opinion, opinions about uh, recite, reciting the Fatiha behind the Imam. Uh, one opinion is that if it is salat uh, sirriya, meaning a silent salat like dohr and asr, and uh, then you, 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 you recite it you know, to yourself. But if it is a uh, jahriya, the loud, loud, out loud salat like fajr or subh, and maghrib and isha, then you listen uh, to the imam. Another opinion is that you recite the fatiha for for all the, the, the prayers, whether they are silent or uh, out loud. Whichever opinion you follow, inshallah, you have, you know, is okay. There is no blame on that. Whichever opinion that you follow, there are scholars and uh, proofs and evidences for that. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Naam. The next question, can we pray sunnah prayer in any direction? like when we are traveling in the car. So the difference between obligatory and the sunan and the wafil. Very good question. Very good question. Um, it is narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was traveling, and of course he didn't have a car, but he had a, 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 either a mule or a camel, a naqa or a baghla, and there he would uh, pray sunnah on top of them and the, he did not mind whatever direction the animal took. He did not, you know, make sure that, you know, the animal was facing the Qibla. So when it comes to Sunnah prayers, if you are in a car or a plane or a van or whatever uh, modes of transportation, you can pray uh, Sunnah prayers without having to worry about uh, the Qibla. Uh, it is best if you can at the beginning, you know, when, when you say Allahu Akbar, if you can 
you know, face or point toward the Qibla, that, that's good, but it is not obligatory, it is not necessary. Now, even if you are praying Fard, and you don't know what the direction of the Qibla is, maybe it's a cloudy day, there is no sun, you don't have a, uh, you know, a compass, so you just make ishtihad, you take the best guess, best estimation, and you pray. If it happens that it was the wrong direction, you don't have to repeat that prayer. That prayer is still valid and acceptable. And Allah knows best. Now. The next question. In what, in what situation, or in which situation, can we combine Maghrib and Aisha? In what situation can we combine Maghrib and Aisha? We can combine uh, Maghrib and Isha when we are traveling. We can combine Maghrib and Isha uh, due to inclement weather, whether it is rain, whether it's snow, sleet, uh, frozen rain, uh, hurricane situations, any kind of inclement weather, we can combine prayers. Some uh, some jobs or some uh, occupations, they have a special ruhsa, special permission, special concession to combine also, like uh, a doctor who is about to perform a surgery that might last five, six hours. So this is you know, a concession. Uh, and also in a hadith by Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you can combine without any reason. However, don't make a habit of it. If you do it once, then, then it is permissible. But, you know, you should not do it, uh, make a habit of, of, of praying just without any, when you, without any reason to combine. And Allah knows best. Now. So on this note, I guess uh, going back to the ayah, Inna salata kanat al mu'minin kitab maqouta. So try your best to make sure that you pray on time. Right. Um, but in cases where something comes up or whatever, there is some flexibility in So on this also, the difference between when we can combine versus when we can shorten. If you can just kind of, uh, I, I think it's relevant over here in this sense. So people don't, you know, they can differentiate between the two. Combining right. doesn't mean shortening. Yes, combining does not mean shortening. Combining and shortening is for traveling. Combining and shortening is for traveling. There is another prayer, it's called Salat al Khawf, the prayer of fear. And this is like during the time of war, or if there is a, uh, you know, you are camping and there is a, a grizzly bear uh, <laughs> roaming around. And, and it's time to pray, you can, you know, Salat al Khawf, you know, you can pray that. But uh, the prayer for the, like for the rain, you can combine, but you cannot shorten. You combine, but you don't shorten. But the prayer of the Musafir, of the traveler, you do both. You can do both. Tra uh, combine the prayer and shorten the prayer. And Allah knows best. There is another question, and I think this might be something that we're going to discuss on Friday in terms of the fiqh of salah. Uh, I think we can delay, but you can decide that, inshallah. The question is, what do we do when we accidentally forget a part of the prayer? What do we do when we accidentally forget a part of the prayer? So we're talking about sujood al sahu uh, I would prefer to leave that until... Uh, the next uh, or the last session because that uh, you could go into more detail. Uh, let's see if you have some questions that are related to, to our topic today. And, but inshallah, we will cover that before the end of the, the, these sessions. Another question, can we combine at home or is combining at the masjid and jama'ah only allowed if it's raining? Can we combine at home versus combining elsewhere? 
Combining at home is, for example, for, for a doctor who is about to perform surgery, but it is not uh, for rain or for, uh, of course, if you are at home, you're not traveling. Yeah, but, but for rain, no, you cannot combine, uh, you know, because the, the ruhsa is, you know, for going to the masjid. But if you are at home, then what, the illa is not there. The cause, the reason for your combining is not there. So if there is a illa, if there is a reason, a cause for that, then yes, you can, you know, take advantage of the concession. But if there is no illa, there is no cause, then, you know, there, then you don't have that concession. I don't see any more questions, so we'll give them a few minutes, inshallah. If there are mm -hmm. any more questions, they can continue asking. You can ask in the Q&A feature, um, or you can directly ask in the chat, whichever one's easier, inshallah. Can we make jama'a with, with wife and husband? I think we kind of mentioned that, but you can go ahead. It depends on what, what do you mean by making jama'ah. You know, if you mean the jama'ah that earns you the reward of the 25 times or 27 times the uh, prayer of the individual person, then no. But uh, it is, you know, uh, it is fine. You can pray with your wife and your children and then, that, you know, that, that's good. Uh, but do, do not, uh, that doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that you will get the 25 times or 27 times the same reward as if you prayed uh, in the masjid with the jama'ah. And Allah knows best. And there's mention on like taking every step towards the masjid, every step that you take increases your daraja, um, mm. also wipes away some of your sins and so on. Um, would you, is, it, is it because of this that the congregation at home versus the congregation in the in the jama'ah has a difference? Well, in one hadith which uh, a lot of the scholars use to um, say that salatul jama'ah is, is, is a must, it's an obligation, when the Prophet sallallahu said, I thought about having the adhan called and the iqama and then going to the houses of people who don't answer the call and burn them down. So it is a very serious wa'id, it is a very serious warning for the people that, you know, if they have no reason why they don't answer the call to come to the masjid. And remember the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the blind man, who came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, I don't have anybody to help me to come to the masjid and do I have permission to pray at home? The Prophet وسلم, he said, yes. But as Abdullah was leaving, he, he called him back. He said, do you hear the adhan? He said, yes. He said, ajib. Answer, answer the other. So if a blind man who doesn't have permission to pray at home, what about us with our cars and with our comfort and with our air conditioning and so on and so forth? So Salat al Jama'a in the Masjid, and Allah knows best and Allah help us. Now, there's another question Will these sessions cover the cat details? Okay. We are going to do right now this how to pray tarawih at home until Friday. After that, we will do a session about fasting. And depending on how this coronavirus lasts, how long this stay at home policies last, then we can go into more, uh, you know, sessions about zakat, about hajj, about other aspects of our deen. But for the time being, this is what we are uh, thinking about. Now, the next question, if we are about to tra start traveling, but we have to leave before the prayer time,
Can we perform the prayer before the time? It is not permissible to pray any prayer before its time, including what we call arrawatib. Arrawatib, these are sunnah prayers that are tied to the fard prayers. So fajr has one ratiba, which is two rak'ah before. Dhuhr, six rak'ah, four before and two after. Asr, there is no rabbit. rabbit. Uh, Maghrib, two after. Aisha, two after. Twelve altogether. You cannot pray them before their time. Of course, you cannot pray Dhuhr before its time. You cannot pray Asr before its time, regardless whether you are traveling or not. The time must come in before one of the conditions, Shurut Sihat Salat, Dukhul Al Waqt. Dukhul Al Waqt. The time must be in in order to pray any prayer. Now. Don't see any more questions. Wait, one more question just came in. Okay. When will okay? This is the sajda of correction, the prostration of correction mm -hmm. become wajib when we make a mistake in salah. I think we're gonna cover this inshallah on Friday. So we can delay that until then. So just briefly, the salat is divided into three types of actions, three three types of, of movements. Al Arkan, the pillars of Salah, Al Wajibat, Al Sunan. If you miss a Rukun, that Raka'a in which you miss the Rukun doesn't count. You cannot fix it, not even with Sujood al If you miss a Wajib, you can fix it with Sujood al If you miss a Sunnah, you don't have to do anything. So learn about the three different types of actions in the Salat, and you will be able to figure out, does it need a, what kind of correction does it need? You, do you need to repeat that Raka'ah? Do you need to fix it by Sujood al sahu Or you don't have to worry, it's, it's okay well, if, you, if you missed it. Inshallah, again, we will talk about that in, in more detail. Now. I'm sorry. If you accidentally pray before the prayer time comes, and then you realize it after the time is over, do you have to repeat the prayer? Yes. If you mistakenly pray a prayer before its time and then later on there is a hadith about that about that man nama an salatin aw nasiyaha fal yusalliha hina yadhkuruha whoever sleep or forget about a prayer let him let her pray it when they remember it so if you forget about the prayer, you don't pray it on time, or you completely forget about it, you don't even pray it, then as soon as you remember it, you should pray it. Now. Okay, you go ahead and close. One minute, inshallah. Yeah.
The period of rest between rakas. I'm sorry? You were in mute. Okay, go ahead. The question, do we need to recite any special tasbih in between of every four rakat and tawih? Um, so the tarawih is called tarawih because of the period of rest between either two rak'ah or four rak'ah or whatever the number may be. And during these uh, periods of rest, uh, you don't have, there is nothing specific that you can say or that you should say. Uh, some people used to, you know, uh, take a break, you go drink some water, you go, you know, uh, when it was in, in Mecca, in the Kaaba, some people used to do tawaf. So there is no really uh, anything specific mentioned about what that you can do uh, during this period uh, between the, the four rakas. What we do in the masjid is give some uh, khatira, uh, some beneficial, uh, you know, small talk about, you know, whether something has to do with the community or was uh, something to do on a personal level. So this is why we, what we do in this uh, during this period of time. Now, another question is: Did you say that we do not have to make that sajda of correction, frustration of correction, if we make a mistake in the sunnah salah? No, that's not what I said. I said the prayer as salat has three different types of actions. So, for example, reciting al fatiha. This is a pillar. The second one is something wajib, like saying Subhana Rabbil Azim in the Ruku', saying Subhana Rabbil A'la in a sujood. These are wajibat. These, you can correct them. For example, instead of saying Subhana Rabbil Azim in, in Ruku', you said Subhana Rabbil A'la. And then you later on you remember. So you can fix it with sujood al sahu And then the Sunan. In the Sunan, there are many of them. Like, for example, when you raise from uh, Ruku' and you say, Sami Allah liman hamidah rabbana wa lakal hamd, hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi ila akhira. That's a Sunnah. If you say it, alhamdulillah. If you don't say it, alhamdulillah. There is no problem with that. You don't have to, you know, do sujood as So, arkan, you cannot fix it. Wajibat, sujood as will fix it. Sunan, you don't have to do anything. I hope that explains. I'm not, I wasn't talking about the, the, the sunnah and the fard. No, all of them are salat. And all of them can, you can make, stay, make a mistake in a fard salat and you can make a mistake in a sunnah salat. And the way to fix them is the same way. So I think the confusion then might have been is the uh, the Sunnah Salah versus the Sunnah of Salah. Of the Salah, exactly. Okay. Um, so the, the vote that we did, um, 14 people responded. And we had um, one person somewhat useful. They found this information somewhat useful. And 13 people found this very useful. So Alhamdulillah, this is good feedback. Uh, it gives us information on how to make things uh, relevant and make sure that the content that's being delivered is whatever is necessary for the people, inshallah. But in the meantime, um, because we didn't see any more questions, what we'll do is go ahead and just give you a quick heads up of tomorrow's session. It will be an in-depth uh, uh, overview of the taraweeh and its formatting in the time of Umar Dilan, as well as the number of rak'at that they prayed and how they changed the numbers and so on. 
and pretty much some of the some of the information that we can use from that in terms of our context of praying at home inshallah and so this is going to be tomorrow and we will also discuss the definition of the word tarawih and how it started and uh, what it means and what it was used for and then inshallah um, we will talk about what time they used to pray in the beginning and how it transitioned over to the time after Isha instead of praying in the, at the end of the night and so on and inshallah then on Friday we'll take all of these lessons that we've um, compiled so far and we'll present guidelines per those uh, inshallah on Friday and then we'll also discuss some fiqh questions like how to correct mistakes and so on so with that inshallah because it doesn't look like there's more questions oh wait there is one more question what is the ruling of uh, for washing the feet in wudu? Do we need to do only masah on it or do we have to wash completely, which is better? This. Okay, when you are making wudu, washing the feet is part of the actions of wudu. However, we have again a concession, if you will, that if you put your socks on or your leather shoes on, when you had wudu, then you have the permission, you have the rukhsar, you have the confession or concession of just wiping, wiping over them. And you wipe on the top, not on the bottom. You wipe on the top of, the, of your socks. And you can do that for a period of 24 hours, starting from the first mesh the first wiping that you do, not starting from when you put them on. No, starting from the time that you put your socks, your shoes on when you had your wudu. The evidence of that is the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam that he was making wudu and uh, one of the Sahaba was about to remove his uh, leather socks or his so shoes and the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Da'huma fa inni adkhaltuhuma tahiratan. Leave them, leave the, 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 the shoes or the socks on because I put my feet in them while I had wudu, while I was in, in, in a state of, of wudu, of tahara. And so he wiped over them. Which is better? It's not a question of which is, you know, what better or not better. These are concessions, this, it's permissible. If you wanna go ahead and like in the summertime, you wanna cool off your feet, you can go ahead and wash your feet. But in the winter time, you know, you wanna just do masah, that's fine. Just wipe over your socks. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, Allah knows best. So we close inshallah ta'ala. Yes, you can go ahead and close and tell it because I didn't see any. So, Jazakumullah khair for your uh, attentive listening and for your uh, questions. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, accept from us these uh, you know, small uh, actions. Uh, whatever was right, it's by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever was not right, it was my fault and, and the shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> get rid of him. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين